welcome back to the Sportsmax Zone. We pick up with the latest from the CONCACAF World Cup qualifiers. Twelve fixtures were contested over the weekend. Bahamas nil-nil against Trinidad and Tobago. Of course, we had Sin Kitts overcoming Guyana 3-0. Panama 13-0 victory against Angola. Of course, Canada beating Aruba 7-0. We had El Salvador again beating US Virgin Islands 7-0. Curacao, an 8 0 win over the British Virgin Islands. Haiti got 10 goals, of course, from that win. Nicaragua, three goals against Belize. Dominican Republic and Barbados, they could only play to a one all draw. We had 10 goals for Guatemala against St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Of course, Suriname getting six against Bermuda. And one goal for Antigua and Barbuda as they beat Grenada. Well, Group F saw major developments following two of those results. St. Kitts and Nevis, 3-0 win over Guyana, and the subsequent 0-0 draw between Bahamas and Trinidad and Tobago. With one game to go, St. Kitts and Nevis are assured of winning Group F and advancing to a second round matchup against either El Salvador or Antigua and Barbuda. Meanwhile, constant off the field and administrative issues must have transitioned onto the field as Trinidad and Tobago have been eliminated from World Cup qualifying. The Soka Warriors cannot advance to the second round of CONCACAF qualifiers, even if they beat the St. Kitts and Nevis Sugar Boys in Tuesday's last game. Well, joining us now on Zoom is Dion Lafoucade, Technical Director of the Trinidad and Tobago Football Association. Welcome, a pleasure to have you. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. All right, so let's start by talking about, you know, what went wrong for our TNT Soka Warriors, you know, from your point of view, when you analyze the game. Right, so for me, um, well, it's a question that comes down to, you know, obviously we needed to get at least one goal um, against Bahamas. So from that standpoint, we obviously did not score that goal and, and, we, and so much we tried. So it's a question of, you know, getting more goals than the opposition. And that day we needed to win the game and it did not happen. Would you say that, because this has been making the rounds in the headlines a lot, non-payment of players, of course, a lot of off-the-field issues, in any way, because you're closest to the camp, so you would be able to answer this best. Would you say, based on what you've noticed, that these issues have been seeping onto the field? And again, to be quite honest with you, I, that would be unfair of me to say that, because I've not been that, that close to the camp. I've gone to a couple um, practices and looked on and so but I'm not really, I can't say that for 100%. That would be unfair for me to say that, you know, um, with, with regards to, the, to, the, to what, what caused the problem. Because we can say many things has caused that problem. But it would be unfair to me to say that, that I really don't know such. Okay, so of course we were able to beat Ghana 3-0. Then we drew with Puerto Rico. What changed from those two matches? Because those were good results, fairly good results, to the one against Bahamas. Of course, Bahamas hasn't been doing well, uh, conceding a lot of goals. So why were they able to hold us to such, I mean, a nil-nil draw? Well, I mean, obviously the, the, the Bahamas coach will have had his tactics, his tactics employed. But at the end of the day, those, I think that, honestly, that question should be for the coach because he's closest to the players. What I do know is that a team that you expect to, to win against you, and as time goes along, you start gaining more and more confidence. So obviously, the, the confidence of the players from Bahamas grew, and it became more and more difficult for us. So but again, that's a question for the coach in terms of what strategy he used and that type of stuff. Okay, so from the technical side of things, which is obviously right up your alley, I mean, I'm a, I'm a trainee, so I know how much pride we have where football, you know, when it comes to football, I remember when Soka Warriors qualified and, you know, everybody's vehicles back home was, um, you know, printed with the Soka Warriors sign. I remember the country was like, it was kind of all, all over again. What is being done, um, you know, from your side of things to at least move football in the right direction? Because I feel as if we've spiraled, you know, downwards and it seems as if we're in a hole and it's difficult to come out of it. it and that's a, that's a great point. You know, um, it's, we are in a difficult place right now. But for me, I am very, very optimistic. I have been, you know, meeting with FIFA as to regards their echo analysis um, forensic study that they did on Trinidad and Tobago along with other countries. And that report is, is due out in, in a few weeks. So they're going to give us some guidance. And so we already have to, we're going to start, of course, looking at properly from grassroots to elite to, to make the, how do we get talent identification? How do we get players picked? The scientific part of it, the sports science side of it. So it's really a, a holistic uh, approach that we have to use, you know, so 
to say it's one reason or the other why Trinidad and Tobago football is so low, it's, it's encompassing of many, many different factors. But for me, from where I sit, I think the future is bright, maybe not right now, but I think we, we are going to come out of this hole because Trinidad and Tobago, you know, obviously was a powerhouse in the Caribbean and in CONCACAF, and we will get back there. I'm, I'm certain of that. Yeah, Dion, I understand your point about, you know, addressing the coach regarding some of these results because he is the man, you know, tactically making the decisions. But we know that Trinidad and Tobago football fans find this uh, weekend result unacceptable. Nil all with the Bahamas, of course. Uh, St. Kitts and Nevis beat them 4-0. Guyana beat them 4-0. Puerto Rico beat them by seven goals to nil. Uh, from a, as, a, as the technical director of Trinidad and Tobago's football, did you see in the past, let's say, four or five months in preparation, this sort of negative result uh, pending? I, well, I have to say no. I mean, I mean, all of the whole country was, was, was obviously surprised, but these things do happen. Unfortunately, it happened to us. So to say that, that it was something that, you know, because, I mean, all right, what, what had happened if we had scored 10 goals? I mean, we wouldn't be having this discussion right now. The fact is we didn't, but... You know, it's just one of those things that happen, and we have to look forward, to, look to move forward. Yeah, um, you've been in this job as technical director uh, just over a year now. Yes, I have been. Yes, yeah, I have. Yeah. Been. Could could you address the 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 technical side of Trinidad and Tobago's football? You have already expressed optimism for the future, but you know, people like to know that the platform is being staged and so on. What could you say? to a disgruntled Trinidad and Tobago football fan now about what's happening now and what can they look forward to in the near future? Well, to use your word, people are disgruntled, and that is understandably so. But I can tell you from where I sit and, and, and being a technical director, and it's not about me alone, there are, there are things that are being done together with the normalization committee and things that are being put in place to really look at the overall entire how, how is our football um, structured? You obviously will know that we obviously in, in debt, so obviously we have to look at financially how we how are we going to support our programs and so so. It, this problem is, is not just something that started overnight. So it's something that we have to really sit back and I can tell you from the, the meetings that I've been in that we are already looking at the overall overall program. What's going to happen moving forward? And hopefully we, we we're going to come up with something that eventually is going to help us to be more sustainable in, in terms of competing at the CONCACAF level. Yeah, but Dion, I have to make the point, though, that this, this disappointment didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen suddenly because Trinidad and Tobago, who are among the top teams in CONCACAF, have been outside of FIFA's top 100 ranking since July 2019. So the fact is that Trinidad and Tobago's football has been struggling for a couple of years now. Yes, most, most certainly, and that is, that is obviously factual. But, but again, what I could say is that we are in a slump right now. That is, that is a given. But I don't think we'll, we'll be in this slump forever. I honestly do not believe that. Mm -hmm. That's why I sound so upbeat. I sound so optimistic. Because we're going through this. And you know what? Sometimes these things, these things are a blessing in disguise. Because it will help us now really put our foot down and look. We, we have not been the only country I've been here. We've not been the only country I've been here. So it's a question of what are we going to do so that moving forward, we wouldn't find ourselves in this, in this, in this position. Okay, Dion, um, thanks for talking to us. Um, uh, good to get your perspective as the technical director. I'm not sure um, how much of a consolation your words were for the TNT fans at the moment, but we look forward to see uh, TNT rebounding. Thank you very much, and, and we, we will get it right. Believe me, we will get it right. I, just, I, I, I feel very confident in that. Yeah, okay, yeah, because th this doesn't look good. Eight-time champions of Caribbean football, um, Mariah. And um, uh, the fact is that, you know, a, a lot of Caribbean teams that would have feared Trinidad and Tobago in the past now no longer fear them. I have to make the point, as I said at the top of the show, that in 2014, when they were trying to qualify, they made a pretty early exit as well second round when the Guyanese beat them. But then for the 2018, they actually reached all the way to the final round of qualifying. So they were able to rebound between 2014 and 2018, but they have gone back again, down, down the ladder. Definitely. And you know, speaking to Dion, he seems extremely confident. It, clearly they have a plan, right? But it's one thing to say that. And Lance, I'm glad you brought that way in 2014, they were not doing good. And in 2018, they bounced back. But the thing is, you know, based on what has been happening with our football in Trinidad and Tobago, and it's so sad to sit here and discuss 
discuss that, especially because, you know, we have been discussing on this show for quite some time everything that's taking place off the pitch. And I have to say that I cannot sit here and say that it has not seeped on the pitch. The players looked very demotivated. You know, there are a lot of um, discussions surrounding, you know, players not even getting a stipend, all these different things. It must have a part to play in the performance. And, you know, even Trinidad and Tobago being locked down, you remember, they couldn't even practice and all these different things. So I just hope, based on what Dion said to us, they get it right moving forward. Yeah, and the fact is, though, most, most of the Caribbean countries have had difficulties preparing. So it's not Trinidad and Tobago alone. No. For, for the most part. Um, you know, the, the average Caribbean team has been unable to train properly. We saw that St. Lucia didn't even enter uh, the World Correct. Cup qualifying. And uh, as I said, congrats again to St. Kitts and Nevis who topped Group F. And uh, they are the only team at the moment confirmed of a spot. There are a full slate of matches set for Tuesday, which will decide the other five qualifiers moving forward to the second round. But the Sugar Boys from St. Kitts and Nevis, hot to trot. Back with more on the Sports Max Zone after this.